Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Father, with uh, hearts that are troubled in many ways, or distracted perhaps, or preoccupied, because, Father, you, you know we live in a world that is uh, pulling at us in many directions. And this world is uh, what it is, Father, because of sin and all that it brings into this world, confusing and distracting and uh, ultimately harming those uh, that await the kingdom. And, Father, we know that it can only go so far in our life and only has so much freedom and that you have saved us from the penalty of that sin, Father. But, but in the meantime, we live in a body that knows it and a world that, that only knows it. And we ask, Father, you'd help us uh, penetrate that darkness, first and foremost by uh, remaining focused on the mission, on the kingdom. And tonight's a small moment in that, in that effort, Father, a moment in which we can set aside the world and all that it calls on us to uh, concern ourselves with and in place of all of that, uh, sit at your feet, consider what your word has for us, what it's had for us for, for millennia, Father, what it's been given to the world to know. And for each of us individually, Father, something in this word tonight for us. We, we trust that. We know that. And we've come here to hear it. And thankfully, Father, we're not, uh, we're not uh, uh, dependent on the weakness of one man to communicate it. But, Father, we know the Spirit will tell us what we need to hear. And so we, uh, we come, to, come to you expecting that kind of education tonight, Father. Please show us what you want us to know. And uh, then as we hear it, Father, I pray that you give us hearts to want to do what we hear so that we're uh, pleasing to you in all respects. That's who we want to be, Father. That's always my prayers when we enter into a chance to learn that it wouldn't just be uh, filling our heads. It would fill our hearts as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when we looked at this book last week, we noted that Samuel opened with a brief look at his family origins. So last week's study was a bit of a warm up into the real thoughts, the real main points of this book. So we're leaving that introduction, that warm up. And we're now going to take a look at the major themes as they develop in the way Samuel writes. And I think if you were here for the Isaiah study, which was some time ago, or if you've done it on your own, then it's a good comparison for us to look at how Samuel writes and how Isaiah's book is constructed. Isaiah is a multi-layered, almost an onion uh, as a comparison, where you peel it back and you find more and more art and more and more uh, depth. And that's why he's uh, often held out to be the most articulate prophet of the Old Testament. Samuel's not far behind him. Samuel's not doing it in poetry so much as was uh, Isaiah's tendency but nonetheless, there are a layering of themes and there's a particular a kind of literary technique that Samuel likes to rely on quite a bit called chiasms. We'll talk about one tonight as we finish the study tonight. And, and chiasms and other literary forms in Eastern writing and Hebrew writing particularly help direct the reader, the student, to the main point, to the ideas that are supposed to be understood. So that even as it's just a narrative of people and events and ideas, embedded in that is a code, if you will, of the main thought, the main spiritual points that we're supposed to take away from the text. So as we move now out of the early parts of the book, the origins of Samuel and his family and get into the details of what happens to this man over the course of his life, it's going to be my responsibility to try to teach not just what happens, but with the meaning behind it as Samuel has given it to us. So there'll be points in time which we leave the narrative and look at it from another point of view. Going to the narrative, though, we learned last time that he was born, Samuel was born to a woman who had promised to give him away in service to the Lord if she could have that child. And since the Lord was the one who made it possible for Samuel to be born, well, then we know that it was always the Lord's intention that his mother would do what she did. As it were, he was withheld from her until this moment so that at his appearing, there could be purpose in his birth. Samuel's going to be a servant of the Lord, she says. He's going to be the son of a priest. And he himself was born of a priest. So he's qualified to serve according to the law in that capacity. So he's going to be raised in the temple by a priestly family. But his family is not the family that we would have expected to produce a child to lead Israel's priesthood. And nor is he likely to receive the favor of the existing high priest. So even though he's been adopted by Eli and he's part of that family, there's no reason to suspect that Eli would consider Samuel a future high priest of Israel. First of all, Eli already has sons who have the potential to serve in that capacity. So it's not going to be the case that Eli would naturally give Samuel the inheritance right. He's the youngest of the family now. Secondly, it's not likely that he would favor a child that he brought in in this way over one that was natural born. So the Lord has made it clear Samuel is his guy 
And yet, by human standards, it's not clear how that could ever come to pass. And so how's the Lord going to bring Samuel into a position of service that he lacks the proper pedigree for? Well, that question hints at one of the important themes that will develop in this book, particularly in this chapter. Because first, God has to remove those who fail to seek him in faith and in obedience. Those who serve him in a selfish desire and a pursuit for what they want rather than what he wants. Those have to be taken out of the way, thrown down, as it were. And you remember in the early chapters of this book, we said this, the events of the first half of First Samuel is set in the time of Judges in a time when people did what was right in their own eyes. So it is characteristic of these people in this time to think of self over what God would have them do. And therefore, the Lord has to move those people out of the way. And then secondly, he has to raise up unlikely men to fill the void left by the departure of the expected leaders. Corrupt men will not stand no matter what their pedigree. And those who have no pedigree will find their way into positions of authority by the Lord's will and providence. And he will put his seal on those. So this is one of the main themes of Samuel's book. And if you know anything about where Samuel goes in his book past this early stage, when he gets into Saul and David, we see that theme play out very starkly in the in the course of those two men's lives of of the one who has the job, but does not have the standing for it. And the one who is deserving of the job, but is unlikely to see it from the human point of view. That's a major theme of this book. And it teaches us a lot about God and his ways. We'll keep coming back to it. Now, the content of chapter two, as I mentioned a moment ago, is arranged in a very structured manner to reinforce the point I just made, but others as well. And we've already seen the opening of this chapter have a very structured form all its own. That is the song of Hannah that we sung or we read that she sung. Thankfully, I did not sing it at the at the beginning of this chapter. So we've already seen how the chapter opened in a structured way. Right. And in that song, you see her extolling God's defending of the weak and frustrating the strength of men. So there's the theme emerging already. Now, the next section, which we start tonight in verse 11, this section is a structured section as well. It's just not structured as a song. And the structure is evident, particularly in the fact that it is framed. This passage I'm going to read is framed by bookends that repeat the theme, but in a new way. You'll see it as we get through it. Verse 11. Then Elkanah went to his home at Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord and the customs of the priests with the people. When any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come while the meat was boiling with a three pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. And thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, well, they must surely burn the fat first, then take as much as you desire. Then he would say, no, but you shall give it to me now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. Now, Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen ephod. Notice how the section opens in verse 11. The boy Samuel ministering to the Lord before Eli the priest. Now, to minister just means to serve. Uh, by the way, if you look at the word in Greek, when you hear somebody called a minister, the word in Greek behind that in English is literally the word to serve, service, a servant, which should, by the way, give you a clue into the heart that someone should have if they are to, quote, minister to another person. They should have a heart of service. And that's the idea here. She is serving the Lord, ministering to the Lord before Eli the priest. The statement is eye opening for a couple of reasons, since you would expect the anointed high priest to do the serving, not a young boy. And secondly, the fact that later in verse 18, you see he's wearing an ephod. An ephod is only to be worn by the high priest, not by just ordinary priests. So the boy's acting like a miniature little high priest. We'll come back to that when we look at verse 18. But just get in your mind there this contrast between the the least likely in the role, playing the role, while you have the appointed one in the role not playing the role. And we'll see that more clearly as well. And then, of course, we're introduced to Eli's sons. In verse 12, we're told they are worthless men. And worthless is a word in Hebrew that can mean a variety of terms. Ungodly, uh, wicked, they are all synonyms. So these are just very ungodly men, worthless men. And the writer gives us two reasons why they're worthless, specifically. First, he says they do not know the Lord, 
which simply put means they are not saints. They are unbelieving Israel. They're like, for example, the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They claim to be near God, and yet they are far from God. That's reason one. Secondly, they abuse their service as priests, clearly. And we're told they despise the offering to the Lord. In verse 13, they do not know, it says, the customs of the priests with the people. Now, those customs refer not to man-made rules, although it may sound like that. The word custom may have given you that impression. That's just another way of saying the rules of the priesthood given in the Levitical system. They are not familiar with or do not pay any attention to how priests are supposed to behave before the people. And we can see that in the way that they're described as acting here. I want you to imagine two men serving as priests who are not familiar with the custom of the priests. Now, remember, they didn't become unaccustomed to them. They have never been taught them. Who do you think was responsible for teaching them? And this isn't merely a matter of ignorance as well. They despise, it says, the custom. So it may have they have some familiarity. Somebody eventually would have said something, certainly. But they prefer to do things their own way for selfish reasons. So look at the contrast that's set up in this passage. It should be very easy to see. You have, on the one hand, a young Samuel serving God, while on the other hand, you have the established priests of Israel, including the high priest, abusing their positions. And if you glance down as I meant, at the end there, as I mentioned, to verses 17 and 18, notice you have that repetition of the contrast. That's why I said there are bookends in this passage. In verse 17, you see a similar conclusion concerning the priests. They are despising the offering and they have sin. And then in verse 18, you have the repetition of Samuel again, ministering before the Lord. So this contrast is intentional on Samuel's part. One person doing what they're supposed to, the other one's not. What they're doing and the details that we read, they're stealing from the people and they're stealing from the Lord. Part of the offering that was supposed to be given every time it came into the tabernacle was to be a payment, if you would, to the Levitical priests, honoring them for their role in the priesthood. And the law was very specific, by the way, of which parts, the breast and the part of the right thigh were the only parts of the meat that were to be given to the priest. And it was to be boiled first, and then they could have the boiled meat. Certain portions of it were allotted to them, sort of their payment. These boys preferred raw because they were going to roast it themselves and have a more tasty meal as a result. And so they would actually go to the part of this sacrifice that was meant to be consumed entirely on the altar. Entirely. They said, no, we want part of that meat and we want it before it's burned. If someone objected, they would try to take it by force. So they're offensive. They're offensive to the Lord. They're offensive to the people. And think about it from the point of view of the people. Think about the abuse that this represents in the face of the people who came to worship. They know the rules as God prescribed them, and they want to come and honor the Lord according to his word, and they come with the expectation that the priests are going to support them in that endeavor, and these guys ruin it, and they have no recourse. So it's not just the matter that they're abusing their office, they're denying the people the, the lawful service of the tabernacle that they've come in an intent to worship God with, and they are an offense to both the Lord and the people. And they serve as an example of the way people in positions of power, great power, especially in religious circumstances, may become self-serving and arrogant over time. Certainly not everyone, but, you know, as the saying goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And these men have that pattern in their life. And that's why I take it personally as a goal. I would encourage you to have the same goal, to maintain a degree of healthy cynicism whenever you observe the piety of men and women who are in positions of religious authority. Because they may not be as pious as you think they are. Few are. And if they're not, then they may just be working the crowd. And and in their perceived piety, they're ingratiating themselves, they're building trust, and then they're going to abuse it at some point. Clearly, that's not what everyone does. But the point is, you don't know right away who's who. So a little healthy cynicism never hurts. And don't be sucked in by a persona or a position or a pretty face. (laughs) Worship the Lord and, frankly, give little regard for his servants because they really don't matter. But there's nothing there to be observed with any sense of of devotion and worship that all belongs to the Lord alone. These men certainly aren't engendering any of that sort from the people they're serving, but uh, they were in their position because of pedigree, because of a line of succession. But that's where absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. They were unaccountable to anyone, but they're forgetting something. They're they're still accountable to the Lord and he's been watching. Now, this contrast continues in the next section. Verse 19. And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children from this woman in place of the one she dedicated to the Lord. And they went to their own home. 
The Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. This is just a great little moment as we move past it, but it's a great chance for us to encourage all you mothers out there who were feeling a little turned off by the fact that some mom could just dump her little boy into the hands of strangers at the tabernacle. And the whole thing just felt wrong, right? Like she turned her back on Samuel. Well, first of all, she's not turned her back on him. She comes to see him annually at the very least. And because of her sacrifice, Eli makes this point of blessing her when she comes with a visit. Blessing her with this pronouncement, this promise, really, of children. Remember, as, as the Lord operated in this particular time of history, the high priest was a prophet and often the man that God would speak through. And so you see him doing that here. And in time, Hannah has more children to take the place of Samuel. In fact, she has five children, which is important only in the sense that the number five is the number of grace, and that's the meaning of her name. So it would appear that, that God has returned her obedience as grace and blessed her as a result of her obedience. That's one of the major themes of Samuel's book. Those who are obedient will be blessed. But she hasn't forgotten Samuel. So whenever she visits, she brings this little priestly robe up for him. And I can't help but think of like what we give kids at Halloween. Kind of looks real, but it's not real. And you know, it's just so cute. You just want to go up there and hug the little priest. And, and since the clothes wear out and he gets bigger every year, you know, she has to make a new one every year that's just a little bigger. Otherwise, he gets high water robes. And that's not going to look good. She's clearly doing this, though, with an intent to encourage him into a certain walk of life. I mean... You know, we talk about parents who dress their kids up in certain outfits because we, you know, doctor, whatever. No one dresses their kids up as a lawyer, I've noticed. But, you know, some of these other professions, that's where we seem to want the kids to go. And that's what she wants. And although, as I said, he is qualified, according to the law, to be a priest, he is a descendant of Kohath. So he is Levitical in his origins. And as well, he's been dedicated to the tabernacle service. So there is that as well. But he's not the son of Eli naturally, and he's not the oldest which would seem to be an insurmountable barrier for him. And therefore, there was no reason to expect him to become Eli's successor. But yet here he is with this miniature robe and the ephod, that uniquely high priest element of the garment, wearing it. Hannah was saying something about where she believed God was taking Samuel, that is to a leadership position, to a high place in Israel. And so you see Samuel looking like a little future high priest, but historically, he does not become high priest of Israel. That's not what God has for him. The Lord has a different plan. So although Hannah has tapped into where the Lord is going in a sense, she sort of misses the target a little bit. Samuel will serve as a priest. He is actually a priest while he serves Israel, but he's never high priest. Instead, he will be the final judge of Israel and he will be the first prophet of Israel, first declared prophet of Israel. So those are high offices. You may remember last week I said this is the moment in Israel's history when the Lord is ready to disassociate the roles of leader, priest and prophet, where before they had always been combined. In Moses day, for example, the roles were united as God brought the law. So Moses was the people's intercessor for the covenant before the Lord. So that made him the priestly role, if you will. He was the leader of the people, self-evidently. He was also the prophet who brought the word. So he was both leader and today we would say king, prophet, priest. He was the leader, priest, if you will, or intercessor and prophet. When you get to Joshua, upon his entry into the land and the establishment of the tabernacle, once the tabernacle is set up in the, in the promised land after they enter in under Joshua, then the priesthood begins to operate. Once the priesthood begins to operate, Joshua now is the leader. He is also the prophet, bringing the word of the Lord, in other words. But now the intercession role has been separated out and given to the priests in the tabernacle. So two of the three still exist in one man. The others have been separated out. Now he's going the last step and he's separating out the role of prophet. So there will be leaders, there will be priests, and there will be prophets before Samuel's life is over. Samuel serves as a transition in which he is qualified to be priest. He is going to be the judge, the leader of the people for a time, and he will be the prophet on earth for a time. He combines all three roles for a short time so that then he can distribute those roles out. The priesthood continues to operate in the temple. He then acts as a prophet and then he will anoint the kings. So he becomes the man through which God separates these roles permanently. Verse 22. Now, Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He said to them, why do you do such things? The evil things that I hear from all these people. No, my sons, for the report is not good, which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? 
But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor before the Lord and with men. We see the contrast continuing. Samuel continues to inject that thought of himself every time he said something about the other side. The story of Eli's sons is really the story of Eli and his sons. And you'll see that very clearly as you look at the text. His sons, we know, are the worst sort. We've already heard they're godless, they're worthless. And now we learn, besides robbing people and despising the offering, now they're committing the worst kind of sexual immorality. They're having sexual relations with prostitutes at the doorway of the tabernacle. Sex with prostitutes was not merely just an act of lust. It was a common practice among Canaanite pagans. So, in effect, these priests are engaging in pagan worship practices in the tabernacle. And then you have Eli. First, we're told Eli was very old. Now, you may see that statement. In fact, it gets made it two or three other times in the story of Eli. The, the fact that he's so old. He's an old guy. He's almost near death. You might think of that as a, a detail intended to paint him in a sympathetic way. Old guy, you know, feeble at the end of his life. But that's actually the opposite of what this statement is intended to convey. Eli's sons are full grown men if he is an old man. And that means they've been under Eli's authority for many years. And as their elder, a very old man, Eli's word and his authority should have been treated with unquestioned respect by those young men. There should have been a very different dynamic in this family if there was an old man at the head of it. Instead, these sons are clearly completely out of control. And you're told in verse 24 that Eli chastises his sons for the evil that Eli hears is circulating. Or the word in Hebrew means passing around. Now, I want you to notice Eli is not disturbed by their behavior so much as by the fact that it's become a point of public complaint or gossip. Eli is concerned about his reputation. He's concerned about the reputation of his family. He's like that monarch that knows his sons are reckless playboys, but he doesn't pay any attention unless they embarrass the family. Now it's a problem. And if this is truly the first time Eli has heard of his son's exploits, and I assure you it wasn't. But if it had been. It would just mean Eli is guilty of gross negligence, says the high priest. How do you not know this stuff is going on below your nose when you're the guy in charge, right? Either way, his son's behavior reflects negatively on the father, and that's, that's the point. Eli is a common, popular preaching example of the sin of bad parenting, and I don't know if you've heard it said that way, but it should be. Biblically, parents are not responsible for the behavior of their children, but they are held to account for poor parenting choices that allow bad behavior to develop. And every child is born in sin. So we all start as parents with a problem child. There's no other kind. Therefore, every child is prone to misbehavior. Knowing that, every parent is expected to take the necessary steps to discipline a child so that they may address the sin. Now, some kids are easier than others, but all kids need discipline. And as I started, no parent is responsible ultimately for the behavior of their child, especially if we're talking about children who have moved into adulthood, adulthood and are just making bad decisions. But... Eli serves as a warning that causes parents not to dismiss their influence too quickly in perhaps the hope of absolving any feelings of guilt. Eli was old, which means he had years to mold the character of his sons, but he failed to do so. And even now we can see how he failed because look at how he responds even here. And you see a perfect pattern of what he must have been doing for decades. He hears of his son's behavior. And what does he do? He gives them a talking to. And a relatively mild one, I might add. He counsels them as if he were speaking to them about running in the halls of the tabernacle or showing up late for work. I mean, think about what he's heard. He's heard that his sons are stealing from the Lord in the role of priest, despising the offering, threatening violence against the worshipers, fornicating with prostitutes, defiling the temple. There really isn't anything worse you could do as a priest. There is nothing worse. I mean, I guess he could have shot the high priest. Right? Right. Any one of those offenses I just listed, any one of them alone, is punishable by death under the law. And yet this man, who is ultimately responsible for adjudicating the law within the temple, does nothing except shake a finger and say, tisk 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 to his sons. And he's concerned only about the image that it presents. If Eli were the kind of father that the Lord requires, he would have removed his sons from service and likely he would have put them to death because that's what was required. But honestly, again, if he were the kind of father who would even do that in the first place, then this situation never would have come about, right? If he was that kind of to do what was right now, he would have been doing what was right before. 
And that's the lesson of Scripture to all parents. I could quote things you know, particularly things like Proverbs 22, 6, right? If you train up a child in the way he should go, even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And you notice the order. The promise of Scripture is that lessons taught to our children early will produce lifelong dividends. Now, again, not with perfection, because if that were possible, we could make everyone sinless by just giving them the right parents, right? It doesn't work that way. But there's a general trend. And I think Paul's statement in Ephesians 6 adds the clarity that you need in order to interpret Proverbs properly. Paul says bringing a child up starts with discipline and progresses to instruction. Because if a child's not accustomed to correction, they'll give little attention or respect to the instruction of elders, whether parents or teachers or law officers. And that's what you see here. Eli's sons don't listen to him or respect him because he will not hold them accountable for their sin. It's a lot easier when they're three and four and five to hold someone accountable because the nature of the offense will be less and therefore the nature of the response can be less. A lot easier to do it then than when they're 16, 17, 18 and 19, when the offense might require jail time or worse. If a human parent will not hold their children accountable, the Lord in heaven will. As weak as Eli is here, he is endowed to speak the word of the Lord. And so he speaks perhaps more truth than he realizes when he tells his sons they are sinning against the Lord. He says, if a man sins against another man, well, then he can expect the Lord will mediate. But not if he sins against the Lord. Friends, if you're like me, the first time you saw that, you thought, hmm, how do you make sense of that? That's got to be wisdom, but I'm trying to figure it out. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm talking about Eli. I'm not talking about Samuel saying this. This is Eli saying this. This advice is specious at best. He says, if a man sins against another man, then the Lord will mediate. But sinning against the Lord leaves no hope. That is not sound theological advice. This is the kind of irrational logic that has driven this man to raise two sons like we see now operating in the temple. Sinning against another man, like murder, for example, is just as punishable as sinning against the Lord directly as the sons are doing here. In fact, his sons are doing both. They're sinning against men and the Lord. I mean, there's no lesser concern because you sin against a man than if you sin against the Lord. The whole idea of it doesn't make any sense at all. Christ has to mediate for us between us and the Father on all sin. There's not some particular kinds of sin he mediates on. This is twisted logic, and it's representative of the training Eli must have given his sons growing up. It's no wonder they have little regard for what's right versus wrong. They're probably totally confused on what is right versus wrong. It's like telling your children that it's okay to cheat on your taxes because you're not hurting anyone. Or the favorite example I have is a mafia boss who orders the murders of rival bosses, but then he apologizes for cussing in front of the priest. Or like the Pharaoh who wasn't willing to commit adultery, but he would murder someone so he could take their wife, right? In the case of Abraham and Sarah. It's that kind of twisted logic that apparently is driving his, his concern over his sons. Anyway, at the end of verse 25, we hear the Lord has already determined how he's going to handle these boys because Eli's not up for the task. It's said here that he is determined to put them to death, as you would expect for these offenses. So in a very real sense, Eli's failure as a father has led to the death of his sons. And the same, friends, can still happen today, including in believing families, in my opinion, when when parents shrink back from their responsibilities, the Lord may step into that gap. Sometimes he'll step in by showing mercy, by raising up a godly child, despite the mistakes of his parents. And I'm not crediting myself or diminishing my parents. I'm simply acknowledging that there's not a quid pro quo. It's not like good parents get good kids automatically and bad parents don't. It's not that simple. But we can't let the exception deny the rule which is that sometimes the Lord will bring discipline upon ungodly children by allowing the consequences of their mistakes to rest on them, to come back upon them. He does so in the case of believers as a measure of discipline in the hopes that he can win them back to repentance and bring them back into a godly walk. But sometimes the Lord may even take the step like the one he takes in this case in which he is willing to put to an end the life of someone who is intent on ungodliness with wild abandon and with no restraints, no self-restraint. We take that chance as parents when we abdicate our responsibility to discipline and to instruct our kids in the way of the Lord. Again, no guarantees, but I can tell you that if you do less than you're supposed to, your chances of getting worse kids than you would have goes way up. And that's just a simple truth of life that we didn't need the Bible to tell us even because you see it in practical terms every day. Finally, look at the contrast with, with Samuel once more. Verse 26, he is growing in stature in favor with the Lord and men. In contrast to all that we see going on with these sons, the sons had everything going for them in the sense of who they were the sons of, where they lived, etc. And it's gone nowhere. And Samuel shouldn't have even existed by human terms. And then he's growing in stature and favor. Is that that phrase growing in stature and favor with the Lord and with men? 
Does that ring any bells? Luke chapter two, speaking of Jesus as a child, Samuel is headed in one direction, picturing Christ, as it were, prophet, priest, leader. And Eli's family's headed in the other. And so now you begin to see how Samuel's going to emerge from this family on top. He's obeying and they are not obeying. Just as Hannah was obeying while her sister wife was not obeying. Obedience results in blessing while disobedience results in defeat and judgment. Perhaps above all other ideas, this is the lesson of the books of Samuel. And now the time has come for the Lord to do as he's declared. Only he will do it much more greatly than we would have expected. He, he's going far beyond merely taking the son's lives. Look in verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people, Israel? Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me for those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength. And the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. You will see the distress of my dwelling in spite of all the good that I do for Israel. And an old man will not be in your house forever. Yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar so that your eyes will fail from weeping and your soul grieve. And all the incense of your house will die in the prime of life. This will be the sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. And I will bring him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. Everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and say, please assign me to one of the priest's offices so that I might eat a piece of bread. So a man is sent to Eli. We don't know this man who he is, what his name is, but. He comes here in the days before prophets. And in these days, before you have a formal man called a prophet of Israel, like Samuel's about to become, you would have occasionally these men who would have a word from the Lord. They would often be called seers or oracles. And the difference is that the difference between one of these guys, oracles, seer and the like, and someone like a Samuel, a prophet, came in the, in the magnitude of their ministry and in the duration of their ministry and in the magnitude of their message. That, that was the distinction. So in this case, as you see, you have a man who comes to Eli for a moment. He has a specific message about Eli pertaining to him, and then he disappears from the record. That was a seer. He's not a prophet as a rule. He doesn't go around doing this every day. He just got an instant need to go do this. God directed him, and he's done. Uh, prophets had a commission to operate for, for a period of time, usually the rest of their life. And so this man is one of these short term messengers and he comes up to Eli and what he tells Eli is going to rock Eli's world. He says, first, the Lord reminds Eli of all that he has done, you know, whose house this is. And you know, by the way, this is my temple, my tabernacle. Who are these sacrifices for again? That's right there for me. The house and its functioning were established by and for the Lord's purposes. And you serve here because I put you here to serve me. So this isn't your place. And it's certainly not your business. It's certainly not for your profit or your personal interest. It's all about me. A very sobering reminder for those who serve the Lord even now. So, of course, he says, I'm taking a very personal interest in how you have been serving me or not serving me. The point is clear, right? The point is that a failure to serve him properly should be of great cause for Eli and his sons. I mean, that should get your attention if the Lord is not pleased with your service. And yet, he says, you are guilty of kicking at the Lord's sacrifices and offering and you honor your sons above me, above the Lord. And you notice he says Eli has been enjoying. He speaks in the plural about the whole family. They've been enjoying the meat that his sons have been stealing. So now you understand that Eli is is offering these half hearted rebukes and the like, because he's actually profiting. He's actually enjoying a bit of the fruit of what these young men are doing in the tabernacle. And so he may not be entirely happy with what they're doing, but he's not unhappy enough that he's willing to stop the flow of profits that are coming in as a result. Right. So he's compromised in that regard. 
It's important to note that the Lord decided to send this word, not to Hopni or Phineas. He sends it to Eli, putting the blame directly on the doorstep of, of Eli. And it shows us who the Lord holds accountable for this situation. The Lord sees Eli as the guilty one, presumably because it would have taken Eli's willingness to allow it to go on for it to even got to this point. Never mind all the parenting issues. Just as we said earlier, a parent shares a degree of culpability when they contribute to the delinquency of a child. And this is what you see here. The Lord declares that Eli is honoring his sons above the Lord. In what sense? How is he putting honor on his sons instead of putting it on the Lord? Well, the only answer to that must be when he fails to correct and restrain them, he's favoring them instead of favoring the the Lord. He's looking at the circumstances and he's saying, I could do what's best for the Lord, but it would require me saying and doing things to my sons that I just don't have the heart to do. So I'm going to favor them by foregoing that kind of response. But friends, you either serve the Lord or you serve human interest. There's no way to cover both bases at the same time, particularly when they obviously are mutually exclusive, when they have different goals. The Lord tells parents to discipline children, for example. Therefore, when you fail to do that, you are honoring them over the Lord. I used to tell my kids uh, when we were raising when they were younger that after they had made a mistake, you know, something that they needed to be punished for when they would object to the punishment. You know, Dad, don't do that. You can't punish me, etc. Or whatever they would say, you know, last minute appeals. I, I had a little speech, which they got really tired of hearing. I said, you know, the Lord tells parents to discipline their children. When you do the wrong things, you can't expect me to do the wrong thing by not punishing you. When they were really young, it didn't make any sense. But when they got older, they couldn't argue with the logic. They realized that in that arguing for me to do the wrong thing, they were contributing to sin upon sin, really. And if I gave in, I would be sinning with them. To not discipline your children is to sin against the Lord. And of course, I hope you understand when we use the word discipline, we're talking about those appropriate ways to enact discipline. Clearly, nothing is is intended to mean otherwise. And Eli is equally guilty of their offenses because not only did he fail to correct them, but he enjoyed the fruit of it. The saddest sight is a parent who celebrates the sin of their kids. Whether that means laughing off their rude behavior or congratulating them for finding a way to cheat on a test or I've seen worse. You know, the parent who glories in their child's rude or brash or ungodly behaviors of one kind or another, taking pride in what a child can get away with or their strength in bullying others. Uh, I think we've all seen that from time to time. That that is a sin in its own. And it's a sad sight because not only are they sinning, but they're encouraging the child's sin to go further. In verse 30, we find what some have called and I think is probably true is essentially the theme of the book of Samuel. You can circle it if you want to have that in your notes. It expresses the thought I just elaborated on a moment ago. Those who honor the Lord will be honored. Those who despise the Lord will be forgotten. And that's true for this contrast of Samuel versus Eli and his sons. It'll be true for David versus Saul. And it's a theme that will run throughout the book on various levels, big and small. Then the Lord reveals his plan for Eli's sons. Remember, this is where I said that there's a lot more going to happen here than just dealing with Eli's sons specifically. In a nutshell, what the Lord declares here is that he will cut off Eli's family line from serving as priests in the tabernacle altogether. All the sons of Levi back in the time of Moses were called to serve in the priesthood perpetually. But this particular family line you're looking at here is going to cease to serve due to the sin of Eli and his sons. But in verse 33, the Lord goes a step further, declaring that the fulfillment of this curse is not going to happen quickly. It will take years to play out so that the Lord can make sure his point is well understood in Israel because it will take till later generations in Eli's family when the priesthood is finally cut off. But he's going to do it so that those who rise up out of Eli's line into the priesthood will die one after another in the prime of their life. None of them will become old men. So they'll come into the priesthood, then they'll die. And then the next guy will come into the priesthood and then he'll die one after another, leaving eventually for the people of Israel to recognize that there is a curse on the family of Eli. Something's up with this family, which is what God wants them to understand so that he can connect their behavior with his response. Then in verse 35, the Lord's not done. He says he's going to promise to raise up a faithful priest to replace Eli's family line. Now, as I said, this takes place over a series of generations. The final fulfillment of this curse happens in Solomon's day when Solomon is king. Solomon removes Eli's great, great grandson, a man named Abiathar, who was the priest, high priest, the final high priest in Eli's line in his day. He does it because Abiathar supports the man who's trying to take the throne from Solomon. 
And so when Solomon wins that battle, he takes the high priest out and deposes him. And no member of Eli's family line ever serves as priests again. As you see him say there at the end, they'll be destitute. Think about it. If you've been a priest historically for generations, you don't have any land. You don't necessarily have any skills. You don't have an inheritance. You're instantly paupers if you can't be priests. And so they're begging to have any office at all in the priesthood, even just a little corner office where they could have a little menial job just so they have money for bread. That's where he's going to lead this family. And in his place, Solomon installs a man named Zadok, who becomes the high priest. You'll notice, he says in this prophecy, that that priest who will come in place of Eli's line will walk before the Lord's anointed always. And of course, the word anointed refers to the Christ. And so this priest who will be raised up will walk before the anointed of God, the Messiah, forever. And that references the Messianic kingdom. And you find out the final fulfillment of all of this in Ezekiel 44 and 48. That's how far God is looking in the future with this prophecy. In Ezekiel 44 and 48, you're told that the descendants of Zadok, who steps into the line to replace Eli, his descendants are the ones who serve as priests in the Messianic temple in the millennial reign. So consider what God just did. He took the line of Eli, which presumably would have found its way into the Messianic kingdom over the history of the earth and cut it off and put a new man in his place who now gets that privilege instead. Which I think is a simple way to explain. You never know what you're putting at risk when you disobey the Lord. It may be temporary, but it could have consequences that you will still experience in some sense going into the kingdom, which, of course, is not what we hope for. But that's how thoroughly the Lord moves to remove one lion and install another. Where before Eli's family abused their power as priests and stole food and so on, now they're begging for charity. Because one family acted in a foolish way, they set the course of future generations on a downward path. And then notice in verse 34, the Lord says that Eli will receive a sign that everything that's just been said is going to come to pass. And the reason he's going to give Eli a sign is because Eli is not going to be alive long enough to see the fulfillment of all of what we just covered, right? So what the Lord's prepared to do is show him through this sign that everything you just heard is going to happen, even though you won't be here to see it. And what is the sign? It's a particularly harsh one, although it's entirely justified. Both of his wicked sons will die on exactly the same day. And of course, the point of doing it that way is that two boys dying on the same day can't be a coincidence especially when it's predicted in advance. The point is, at the moment of it occurring, Eli's going to have a clear understanding of everything he's heard is coming. Now, how do you suppose he'd react to this prophecy? You're a dad. You hear about this. You have your two sons. What do you do? Perhaps you cry out in repentance, right? Beg for mercy. Ask for the Lord's mercy. You remember what David did when he heard that he would lose his son because of his sin with Bathsheba? Second Samuel 12 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house and then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child and David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Okay, so that's how you act when you realize, oops, and I hear what I'm going to have to experience, but I don't want that, obviously, and I want to try to appeal to the Lord for mercy. And, and he made all those appeals. He fasted, he prayed, he kept vigil, and so on. That's how a man after God's own heart responds to the Lord when he learns he's sinned. What does Eli do? Well, you don't hear anything at this point, which in itself is telling, I think. In the next chapter, and I don't want to get there tonight because we're going to get there in due time, But in the next chapter, Eli is going to hear again from the Lord, this time through the mouth of Samuel. And Samuel's going to give very similar commentary, very similar prophecy. And when we see his reaction in in the next chapter, you're going to learn that his response is anything but like David's. We're seeing the the rationale here behind the Lord raising up Samuel to lead his people. The leaders of Israel are corrupt. And if you study the book of Judges... You know, this is in the time of judges. You understand that already. The leaders are corrupt. But now you're getting to learn the priests are corrupt in Israel. So Israel isn't just saddled with corrupt leadership and weak and effective leadership. They've got corrupt priests and they have no prophets apart from those who are in the judgeship. And so where do men go? If you're in Israel, where do you go for godly direction within Israel? You have the word and that certainly is the rock. But within the the realm of human leadership, where do you go? It's evident that men cannot rule 
themselves, even under God's authority, because their sin is a barrier to obedience. Instead, God must bless those who serve. He must raise them up. He must give them the, the, the word and the counsel. And usually, as he is prone to do, he pulls someone in who you would not expect, who does not have the pedigree, which sets them presumably on a course in which pride is not going to be as much a risk for them as it would be if they came from any other direction. And in chapter two, you see this this play out in in all the examples we gave and in a chiastic structure. So the last thing I want to do tonight is I'm going to draw for you the chiastic structure for those who may be listening and not here tonight. If you look in the notes that accompany this lesson, you'll see the chiastic structure in the notes. But for the benefit of those who are here, I'm going to show it to you because chiasms are hard to explain in words. They are by their very nature, visual representations evident in the text. So this is the chiasm of chapter two. Chiasms are a literary technique in which you take a progression of thought, moving from point to point to point, developing the thought through those points. And at a certain place along that progression, you begin to back out, as it were, reverse out the same points in reverse order. And we can indicate it by this kind of a a nomenclature. What do you think the point of a chiasm is? The point is the point. Chiasms are directing your attention at the point. Look at the chiasm of this chapter. In the Song of Hannah, you have that reference near the end to the Lord's anointed. If you look, I think it's around verse 10. Then shortly thereafter, verse 11, you have Samuel ministering, serving, right? And then next you see the sins of Eli's sons described from around verses 12 through 17. The next thing you find is Samuel ministering in verse 18, 19. And then the point becomes what? Eli blesses Samuel. Now, it doesn't say Samuel specifically. It says his parents, right? But in the patriarchal culture and in an Eastern mindset, the father's blessing becomes the son's blessing. The family's line is blessed, right? So he's blessing Samuel's family. And I'm putting that kind of in parentheses, but it's really Samuel that's the ultimate recipient of this blessing. I'll come back to that. Look at how it reverses out. D prime, the same thing. Samuel grows before men, before the Lord. In other words, this line mirrors this line in the sense of sentiment, main thought. C prime, it's another description of the son's sin, Eli's son's sin. And that's around verses 22 to 25. The verses are all in the notes if you want to see them later. And then B prime, Samuel grows in the Lord's presence, verse 26. And then A, look at the very end of A. Do you see the reference that mirrors the first one? A reference to the Lord's anointed again. So the whole thing is framed by the Lord's anointed, by the power of God, by Christ. So Christ brackets the whole of it and focuses it down to this. Now, what's interesting about this is the point. How would you describe the point? How would you characterize the meaning of the point? It's, this isn't just a game where I'm trying to solve a puzzle. What's the spiritual importance of E? What does it mean that a man blesses another man in that way? And considering who they are, you have one man anointing his successor. Without even knowing it, Samuel's being prepared to take Eli's place. Samuel's parents raised godly children to replace the ungodly children that Eli is raising. So you see that juxtapositioning on both sides here. Eli's sons are going to give way to Samuel. Well, it all centers on Eli not even realizing how God is putting him to use as a prophet, pronouncing his own retirement when he blesses Samuel through his parents. So the Lord removes the disobedient to install the obedient, and he is so powerful he can even use the disobedient to make the installation. And the structure of the chapter is showing you the point that Samuel's rise was as a result of the need to fill this gap, this problem with what was in place through Eli's family, It's not limited to Eli. It's indicative of the age, of the time of Israel, where men were doing what was right in their own eyes. God didn't leave them there, though. And he raises up a man who would take the place of those who could not do what God required. And and remember, I said, I think last week, that a key theme that will come up periodically is sovereignty. If you can't see God's sovereignty moving the chess pieces on the board of history here through the lives of people who aren't even willing, who, if they knew what God was at work doing, would not have been willing participants but are still orchestrated by God to make things happen as he sees fit. That's a confirmation for us of how God can 
move everything to his will. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your sovereign will. It is so reassuring, Father, to serve a good God, a just one, a mighty one, a wise one, one who sees the beginning and the end at the same time and who is moving to bring things all to its appointed end and to do it all for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And to be one of the called and to be called a child of God by faith has, has given us such hope to know that no matter what the world may do or wish to do, that it cannot compete with the power that you have to bring things to your desired end. And that's true, Father, not just on the pages of history, but it's true in our individual lives as well. We know that we are called to live a certain life in honor to you, and we, we stumble at times, Father, and you are quick to forgive us according to our hearts, but our, our hearts desire to repent. But, but ultimately, Father, we will be with you because Christ has paid the penalty for all of that. And yet, Lord, we also desire to make the most of our life. Let us serve like Samuel did, ministering to you. And doing so without concern, Father, for what it does for us individually. And uh, we trust you with all the rest. Thank you for tonight. Bring us back next week, Father, if it's your will. Let us continue in this story. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.